Read the story of Palm Sunday from Luke chapter 19. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany on, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is God's word. Maybe see it. Dear friends of Jesus, on one day, the people actually got it. Isn't it nice when you have one of those moments when, like in your mind, the light bulb goes on? On one day, Palm Sunday, people actually recognized who Jesus really is. That's striking because in the Bible, there were a lot of days when people didn't get it. There were days when people wanted more free food from Jesus more than they wanted a, a savior. There were days when people thought that politics was more important than the forgiveness of sins. There were days when even Jesus' 12 disciples didn't recognize who Jesus really was. But on Palm Sunday, people finally got it. They welcomed Jesus as their king and as their savior. It must have been a, a striking scene. I've been there to the Mount of Olives. I wasn't actually there on the first Palm Sunday. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. But I've been to the Mount of Olives, and it's quite a scene. The city of Jerusalem is surrounded by hills all around it. One of those hills is the Mount of Olives. And when you stand on the Mount of Olives, you can look down and see the whole city of Jerusalem spread out in front of you. It's quite a sight. Bethany and Bethphage, the towns that are mentioned in our lesson, are towns on the Mount of Olives. It's about a two-mile walk from there down the hill into the city of Jerusalem. It was quite a scene. This wasn't the first time that Jesus had entered Jerusalem. He had gone to Jerusalem dozens of times. He often stayed at Bethany. At Bethany is where some of his closest friends lived. Do you know who lived at Bethany? Mary and Martha and their brother. Lazarus, Jesus often stayed at their house. He often went into Jerusalem, but this time was different. And Jesus knew it. And so he asked his disciples to go and get him a sweet ride. It was like a Mustang convertible. It really was a convertible, right? But it was a colt. It was the colt of a, of a donkey. Jesus didn't ask for a ride because his feet were tired. Jesus was fully capable of walking two more miles all downhill into Jerusalem. But he asked for that ride because that's the way God had said it would happen. 500 years before Jesus, the prophet Zechariah had prophesied, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the full of a donkey. God had said that the Messiah, the Savior, would come to Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and God always keeps his word. He always keeps his promises. But maybe we would still ask, why, why was it a donkey? If it were me, I think I would have rode into Jerusalem on a lion. Wouldn't that have been cool? Or at least an elephant. Famous people in, in the ancient world, they rode on horses. Alexander the Great conquered the whole world on his famous horse. Do you know Alexander the Great's famous horse's name? It was 
Bucephalus. Ever heard that before? The horse itself is famous. Bucephalus. Bucephalus. You can even visit Bucephalus' tomb today. This famous horse. Ancient people rode on horses, and yet Jesus, he rode on a donkey. Why? Well, if you look through the Old Testament, you actually find that in Israel, leaders and kings often rode on donkeys. Even someone like King David. And so when Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, it seems like a donkey was the perfect choice. It showed the people that he was coming as king, just like their ancient kings had come. And yet, a donkey was, was this lowly creature. They, they recognized Jesus was coming as a king, not to, to rule over them. What was Jesus coming as a king to do? He was coming to die for them. Riding into Jerusalem on a, a donkey. And for one day, people actually got it. As Jesus started his descent down that Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, they put palm branches and their coats on the ground and they said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And that, that sounds nice, right? But that's actually a Bible verse. It's from Psalm 118. At Passover time, whenever the Jews traveled to Jerusalem, they would recite together on the way Psalm 118. And what time of year was it that Jesus was going to Jerusalem? It was Passover. And the people that they recognized, this verse in Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is talking about Jesus. And they understood it so well, they actually added a word. They didn't just say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord for that one day. They welcome Jesus as he really is, our Savior and our King. And they said, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Does that sound familiar? <coughs> peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What does that remind you of? Christmas. I had never made that connection before in my mind until this last week. Some of you are way ahead of me. Remember what the angels said on Christmas to the shepherds? They said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Can you see how Jesus' life had come full circle? On Christmas, the angels shouted, Glory to God in the highest and peace on, on earth to those on whom his favor rests. On Palm Sunday, the people joined in. They said, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. For one day, people joined in with the angels to praise Jesus for who he really is. But I keep saying, for one day. You know what's going to happen, right? I don't like to spoil suspense for people. But I'm going to do it today. On Friday, Jesus is going to die on the cross. It's really a crazy week, isn't it? From palm branches and hosannas to crucify him in just five days. And we think about Holy Week. It's easy for us to criticize those people on Palm Sunday. We say, man, it was just for one day. They didn't really mean it. Later, they crucified him. But, but the Bible doesn't make those criticisms. For all we know, it was two totally different groups of people. Jesus' disciples, his believers, chanted Hosanna on Palm Sunday. The rest of the people chanted, crucify him on Good Friday. And we'll get there on Friday. But for today, notice this. Those believers in God on Palm Sunday, they praise Jesus for who Jesus is. Notice that they didn't ask Jesus for anything. That's really unusual. Because people were always asking Jesus for things. We're always asking Jesus for things, right? Heal her. Heal me. Answer this. Help with this. But on Palm Sunday, they didn't ask Jesus for anything. Instead, they praised Jesus for who Jesus is. They praised God for who God is. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Do we? As I studied these verses over the past week, this, this question came into my mind. Do we praise Jesus for who Jesus is? Or do we praise Jesus for what we want Jesus to do for us? Those can sound similar, right? 
But they're completely different things. Do we praise Jesus for who Jesus is? Or do we praise Jesus for what we want Jesus to do for us? It's too easy for us to make God a means to an end. Do you know what that expression means? A means to an end. It's too easy for us to come to God for the things we hope to get from Him down the road. It's too easy to come to Jesus for the stuff we hope He gives us. All of us have done this. That's why we say we, we need help in our marriage. And so we better start going to church. Or to say, I want more money or more happiness or more possession. So I, I guess I better start praying. It's not going to Jesus for Jesus. It's going to Jesus for the things we hope that Jesus brings to us. It's, it's making Jesus a means to an end. Do we do that? I think we do. People have been talking more and more about the consumerization of Christianity in America. That's actually a word. I looked it up. Consumerization. What it means is that we Christians in America are becoming more and more like consumers. Like shoppers. And what are shoppers, consumers, what are they always concerned about? Where can I get the best deal? What's in it for me? Afraid that's describing us as Christians more and more in America. You look at your schedule for Holy Week, and the thought that comes in our mind is, is what God's going to do for me, is it really worth it to give up two nights this week? God better have a lot in store for me, right? When we look for a church, we think to ourselves, which church offers me the most? Where can I get the best deal with the, the smallest sacrifice? Is that how we think? Is that how we talk about God? About church, we're just consumers. Like God better have a good product. We'll move on to somebody else. But if you or I ever go to God for the things we hope he gives us, we don't know who God is. If you or I only praise Jesus because of what we hope Jesus will do for us in the future, we don't know who Jesus is. Jesus isn't a means to an end. Jesus is the end. Jesus is the goal. I once knew a pastor who, after a worship service one day, had somebody walk out of church and say to him, Pastor, I'm sorry to say it, but I didn't like that worship service. It just wasn't for me. Do you know what the pastor said back? He said, good, because we weren't worshiping you anyway. I don't know if I'd be brave enough to say that. But if you test me after church today, I might. But you know, Jesus was brave enough to say that. Our lesson stopped today and there's a little more to the story. After Jesus entered Jerusalem, he looked around at all the people of Jerusalem who, who didn't praise him, who didn't worship him. And we're told that Jesus wept. Palm Sunday. It's one of two days in the Bible that we hear that Jesus wept. And Jesus said to those people who, who weren't there praising him, he said, if you, even you, if, if you knew on this day where you could find peace, and yet it's hidden from your eyes. There were all of these people, Jesus was standing right in front of their face, and they didn't see it. All they thought of was all the other things they wanted. If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, yeah, it's hidden from your eyes. Jesus isn't the means to the end. Jesus is the end. Jesus isn't someone who, who brings us peace through stuff he gives us. Jesus is our peace. Whatever it is that you're looking to Jesus to give you, that's not the thing that's going to give you peace, even if you're able to have that child, even if you get that car, you get that house that you want. Even if your health gets better, that's not what's going to bring you peace. If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, and yet it's hidden from your eyes. I can only speak for me, but, but I can say that too often I go to Jesus for what I hope he gives me. I make Jesus a means to an end. 
I don't come to Jesus for Jesus. Do you? But Jesus still comes to me. Jesus still comes to us. Remember how I told you from the Mount of Olives, you can see the whole city of Jerusalem. It's all spread out right in front of you. Imagine Jesus' perspective on, on Palm Sunday. From the Mount of Olives, Jesus could see the Garden of Gethsemane, where his own friend betrayed him and his own people arrested him. He could see it. It's right there. From the Mount of Olives, if Jesus looked in this direction, he could see the palace of the high priest, where injustice rained down on him, along with spits and insults and blows. He could see it. From the Mount of Olives, Jesus could see Pontius Pilate's fortress, which was connected to the temple complex. He could see where he was going to be condemned. From the Mount of Olives, Jesus could see the place outside the city walls where they put the crosses, where people got crucified. Jesus could see it all as he rode on that donkey. He could see it. And unlike the crowds that day, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen to him. He knew about the arrest. He knew about the trial. He knew about the beatings. He knew about the cross. And he still came. Why did he do that? Why didn't he turn the donkey around? Go the other direction? It's because he loves you. To Jesus, you are not a means to an end. Jesus doesn't just pretend to be kind to you so he can get your money or something like that. Do you know what Jesus wants? You. You're the end. You're the goal of the donkey and the sufferings and the cross. It's all because Jesus wants you. He wants to love you and forgive you and save you and make you his own. <clears throat> and when you and I get that, do you know what you have to say? Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We don't praise Jesus for what we hope Jesus will do. We praise Jesus for what Jesus has done. We don't come to Jesus for what we hope he will give us one day. We come to Jesus for what he has given us. Peace, forgiveness, life, and joy. That's why a Christian praises Jesus every day when times are good and when times are bad because our praise doesn't depend on what Jesus has given me in the moment. Our praise depends on who Jesus is. And Jesus is the same every day. Hosanna. That's what Jesus was teaching us in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught us how to pray. Remember how the Lord's Prayer starts? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The word hallowed means holy, glorified. Jesus says when you pray to God, start with this. Hosanna. Glory to your name. Just think in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to pray, hallowed be your name, before we pray for daily bread. Even before we pray for the forgiveness of sins. Even before we ask God to protect us from evil. Hosanna. Hallowed be your name, God, for who you are. That, that's what Holy Week is all about. It's not about our sacrifice. It's not about what we have to give up. Oh, it's not about all the times we're going to be at church. Come to church. For Jesus. Come to Jesus. For Jesus. Our King. Our Savior. Our Redeemer. Our Shepherd. Our God. Hosanna. If we don't say it, the, the stones will. Isn't that an unusual way for our lesson to end? The Pharisees come up to Jesus knowing that the crowd is recognizing Jesus as the Messiah and they don't like it. They say, Jesus, stop them. And what does Jesus say? If they are silent, the stones will cry out. Jesus will be praised. Even if you and I don't do it, Jesus will be praised. And the truth is, sometimes nature has, it does a better job recognizing its creator and savior than we do. Every morning when it comes up, the sun says, Hosanna. 
Every night as they twinkle in the sky, the stars say, Hosanna. Every spring as the grass turns green, it says, Hosanna. Every day when the birds sing, they sing, Hosanna. Jesus will be praised. Let's join in. Not just for one day, but with our lives. Hosanna. Come to Jesus for who Jesus is. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, on that one day, those believers in Jerusalem got it. They welcomed you as their Savior and as their King with palms and clothes and hosannas. Dear Jesus, so often we, we don't get it. We make you a means to an end. We, we come to you wanting you to give us other stuff that we think will bring us peace and happiness. Lord, today we recognize that's, that's so far from the truth. You're not the means to an end. You're, you're the end. You're the goal. You're our peace. Dear Jesus, just like those people on Palm Sunday, just like nature around us, may every day of our lives be a day of coming to you for who you are, of praising you for who you are, of shouting Hosanna. To your name be glory. Amen.